Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Lemaire. I'm a programmer at the American Cinematheque. To give you all an image description, I'm in my home here with my light blue wall behind me. I've got short, wavy brown hair, blue eyes, and I'm wearing a plaid green shirt. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our virtual Q&A for the amazing documentary, Crip Camp, A Disability Revolution. Tonight, we're very excited to have the two filmmakers, Nicole Newdom and James Lebrecht, both joining us. Uh, and our moderator for tonight is Carla Renata, who is the creator and host of the Curvy Film Critic. So without further ado, let's welcome her and our filmmakers. Thanks. Hello, 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 and good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you happen to be while you are watching this. I wanna welcome you to American Cinema Tech's conversation and Q&A centered around Crip Camp, which is currently now streaming on Netflix. I am your moderator, Carla Renata, otherwise known as the Curvy Critic, and we're going to dive into a deep discussion. Well, no, not that deep. <laughs> with the filmmakers Jim LeBrett and Nancy Noonan. But before we get into that, I am an African-American woman with red lipstick, my hair piled on top of my head with a shirt that says, underestimate me, that'll be fun. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so now that I've done that, let me introduce and bring onto the stage and onto the screen, Jim and my girl. <laughs> Nicole, how you guys? How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. I heard you holler when I showed that shirt, Jim. <laughs> I think that's the theme of Crip Camp, is it not? I think it is. Hey, let me give my image description. Yes, uh, of course. I'm, I'm Jim LeBrecht. I've got long, uh, curly hair and uh, dark glasses and a mustache and goatee that's getting very, very gray. A black shirt and behind me is a red wall with some uh, posters on it. And I'm dial dialing in from Oakland, California. And Nicole? I'm Nicole Noonan, and, uh, and I am uh, a white woman with brown hair about down to my shoulders and uh, round glasses that look like Judy Humans and Crip Camp because she's my style icon, um, and at least for glass glasses. Um, and I'm sitting next to a bookcase in my house in Oakland with a yellow wall behind me and a, um, a Greek bazooki instrument hanging on it in the background. Ooh, that was very descriptive. I did forget <laughs> to describe what is behind me. So I have a little sofa and pink, very pink furry pillows behind me on my chair and some theater posters on the wall and my emblem, the Kirby Critic in rose gold hanging on the wall. So now that we've gotten the logistics out of the way, let's get into this film. Most of the people or almost everyone that has that is in this virtual conversation tonight has seen the film. I had the distinct pleasure of being at Sundance 2020 when the film debuted there at the Eccles. And I was telling Nicole before you came on to the, the line, Jim, that I remember being so incredibly salty that I had to climb up those stairs and go to that last row in the Eccles Theater to see that film. And then I saw the film and I was so ashamed of myself that I even had that thought process because here was I was watching a film where I'm able-bodied I got some you know metal parts here and there I'm a little bionic here and there but like most people in my age range but I could still walk up and down the stairs and I was so ashamed and embarrassed that I even had that thought process after I saw the film because I realized that this is the thing about the disabled community being a woman of color being a black woman a black film critic and just black in America I know all too well what it is like to be treated other and different. So for those reasons, I was like, man, I will never, ever, ever have that thought process ever again in my life. I was so ashamed and just so annoyed at myself. But what I really want to talk about is this quote that I saw online from uh, Judy, where she says, how are you? Oh, no, that's not it. She said, where is it? If I ever have to feel thankful about an accessible bathroom. When am I ever going to be equal in the community? I kind of love Judy because Judy's like the Jane Fonda of the disabled community. Like she takes no mess from nobody in any lane at any time ever. And I just wanted to get you all's thoughts about that quote because it's so apropos for the fact that 
this, this, these bills and these addendums to the bill that was supposed to be part of the Disability Act, you guys still have to fight for those rights. And that's just not right. Well, I mean, I, you know, I think Denise Jacobson at the end of her film sums it up really well when we talk about the ADA and that, you know, you can pass a law, but in, unless people's attitudes change, it's really not going to have a lot of power behind it. And, and then, and actually to your point about climbing those stairs, you've had an experience by watching our film and getting a sense of what our lives are and like these, these ramps and these door handles that are not knobs and the curb cuts and the spots, they didn't just magically appear. They were fought for. They were really, really fought for. But the thing I, you know, I, I want to say to you, hey, look, you know, we hoped that we would start conversations with this film, that we would have people really think about things. And the fact that, you know, this changed how you thought about disability or yourself that's what we wanted people to start considering and really thinking and get a get a view about really what it means and and when you talk about the law what what is that law that law is an intent it's not like a checkbox it's like these are things that you ideally you want to do as opposed to feeling like you're forced to do mm -hmm. yeah you, you want to add to that nicole yeah, I mean, that um, that particular quote from Judy, you know, comes in um, the film right after the victory of the 504 le legislation, you know, as we know it's going to be enacted because the sit in was successful and it's sort of a, you know, it's a it's a it's a really kind of climactic moment in the film. And we were really struggling in the edit to figure out how do we keep that moment from from being um, you know, oversold to the audience. You know, we wanted people to be able to um, to experience the kind of the joy and the release and the um, the feeling that this community of folks had come together to do something really extraordinary, which was true. But we really didn't want, especially a non-disabled audience, to be able to just kind of sit back and go, "Well, that's great," and that's how it all got, you know, fine for everybody. You know, no. and it, it was hard. And and all of a sudden, like right before we were done editing, and maybe like a month and a half before we wrapped editing, um, this artist um, said, I, you know, I did this art installation in LA where I asked all these um, disabled women and women of color to come to um, the Roche Babois furniture showroom in downtown LA in 1980 and talk and sit in circles and talk about their experiences of marginalization. And they were, um, they were sort of reviving that um, art installation um, in a retrospective of her work at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And so she was looking for people who had been in it and, and Judy was. And she said, you know, do you know how I could track down other people um, from the disabled community who were, who were in that thing? And I said, well, you were filming that? Do you have the film? Can you send us the film, you know? And we got that clip. And it was like mana from heaven for us for the film because it's such a powerful moment when she says that because it kind of flips everything you're thinking if you're thinking like no isn't that great and that's when we decided to give this thing to people with disabilities it just um disabuses you of that notion and and then that kind of anger of judy's and that sense of kind of indignation that she's being asked to feel grateful for something so basic you know um, is kind of the propulsive energy into the last act of, act of the film. And we really didn't have it until we had that incredible moment that sort of fell in our laps at the end. <laughs> I love that moment. I wanted to start with that so that we can work our way backwards to the beginning. Okay, but I just loved, loved, loved that quote. And I, I loved how the film led up to that moment. So I know that, so I was talking at the beginning of our conversation about being at Echoes. At, at Sundance in that moment and it premiering and all those people being on stage. I was saying, Nicole, it was like, Nicole called it like the chorus line. It was like a chorus line of people that just, the line of people just never ended. It just went on and on and on. And it was like tears and tears and tears of people behind. I just wanna know for both of you all, what was the culmination of that moment like for you? You guys got this footage together. You went to each other and said, yo, let's do this film. And then it's at the Sundance Film Festival. And let's just note 
that is produced by Higher Ground Productions, which is Michelle and Barack Obama's production company. All of that has come together. And here you are having this surreal out of, bottom, out of body moment. What could that possibly have been like for y'all? Because I know what it was like for me. It's so great. And I wasn't in the film, but I know what it was like for me. <laughs> I mean that that I mean that was the first time I really saw the film with an audience. Oh. And um, we were sitting near each other, and it's just like, and and there were certain moments you kind of get oh they're that they're getting it, and then you know the camp director says oh yeah I'm digging these ditches because the kids are kind of clumsy and I want to see if they trip or True. not, and the audience laughs. <laughs> and it was like okay they're getting it. <laughs> I did. I hollered when I heard that with that <laughs> scruffy voice of his and looking all disheveled. It was hilarious. Oh, that guy was just, a, oh. he, he was, a, he was fabulous. I mean, as long as I'm talking, I'll, I'll share my experience of being up there. It was just seeing all those people um, standing and being on the stage with so many other people. I mean, from the film, but people with disabilities, my community, it felt like a real moment in time. Hmm. And, and I can't talk about this without feeling a little emotional. And I think that it harkens back. And I, 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 you get a sense that maybe finally we came into our own or people recognized us as a community and that people would realize that we are not what you see in these horrible representations that so many times people see of us, but that this is who we are and we have a story. And oh my God, you, you were moved by our story. I was, I was moved by your story because I could resonate with it wholeheartedly on a whole nother level that I don't think either one of you will ever understand. Nicole, you want to talk about what that moment meant for you? I mean, uh, it's true. Um, I, I was so elated to come into the theater and sit with our group because um, it had been such a, um, you know, such an overlooked story for, for so long. And the sense that we were finally going to introduce the world to it on this kind of big platform was exhilarating and also we were sitting together which was only made possible because Sundance agreed to pull a bunch of seats li literally like pull up seats that were drilled into the floor so that we could have our entire entourage of wheelchair users sitting together which is what film teams do when they come in for their premiere at Sundance they all yes. sit together and you know and first they were like well here we have the theater and there's wheelchair seats here and wheelchair seats here and then there's a couple in the back and there's you know, double the amount that there used to be last year. And Jim was like, well, what do most teams do when they come in? They all sit together and there's sort of this silence and they're like, OK, we'll work, we'll work that out. And I, for me, that's just kind of like a symbol of kind of what it felt like. Um, the whole moment felt like it felt like some glass was shattering or some something was going to change. And when um, when we got up on the stage and the lights came on, I was just sort of like blinded by the fact that the applause was so loud and so long. And then Jim kind of pulled on my sleeve and literally like had to point out into the audience. So I was kind of squinting out there um, and, and then realized that everyone was standing and, um, and it, it truly was amazing. But then when that standing ovation ended, then uh, after I answered a question, the next question was for better answered by Judy. So I had Judy Human who's in the film. So I handed Judy the microphone and then there was another whole standing ovation and Corbett O'Toole, this incredible activist who's in our film and was on the stage said that's when she knew that it really had landed, that people really got it because people were paying, people literally like rose to their feet again for Judy um, and in a sort of the, the stature and the weight of who she is as a civil rights leader and what she fought for was really, I think um, just the sense that people got that was really profound. Cool. Um, there's a question from the audience that I think ties into where we are in the discussion right now. They're saying, what I loved about the film was the authentic representation. Can you talk about the genesis when you pitched the concept? Oop, where'd it go? It went away. Oh, there it is. Where'd it go? It went away from me. 
<laughs> uh, hold on one second. I'll find it. Mm, there it is. Okay. When you, okay, I'll start over. What I loved about the film was the authentic representation. Can you talk about the genesis when you pitched the concept? Did you get any resistance? And what advice do you have for filmmakers that are disabled that would like to do something in this lane? You want to start off, Nicole? I mean, well, yeah. I can just tell a really quick story about resistance, um, which was from my end as like the able bodied member of our team. Um, when I got ex really excited about this idea, I was kind of checking around with, you know, other colleagues and folks that I knew in the industry about whether or not they thought the, the film would resonate. And many people did. Um, but, uh, but I also heard like, that's not a good career move. There's no audience for that, you know? And it actually was like, not just um, about disability, but it was also about age, you know? Like mm. you know, a bunch of old people talking about sex, you know? So it's like, um, I, you know, I, I think there was definitely like a, uh, also sometimes we dealt with a little bit of a sense that, you know, this could be a nice film for, for the disability community, you know, and people not seeing it sort of larger, larger potential. But um, but then we cut some footage together, and uh, and that really uh, changed things. Because even in a even in like a short trailer, I think we were able to get across that this film. Well, basically, the trailer had to disabuse people of you know the kind of tropes and um and just assumptions that they were making about what content around disability is because the content around disability has not been made by disabled people and it, it's not authentic and it doesn't work and so when people saw it could see it then they started responding really well sorry jim that was that's okay no, did no, you no, want to no. add anything jim if i might thank you yes you can you're welcome <laughs> oh my god I haven't had this much fun in a long time. Um, uh, I think the authenticity is the reason that the film is resonates so strongly with people. That it wasn't a group of non-disabled filmmakers looking down upon us and asking us questions or filming us getting out of bed as Corbett joked about when we were filming hers. You know, usually this, you know, I don't do these anymore because, but I will for you. And I will for you and Nicole, because as a member of the community, her belief and the other people was that we would take their their lives, their stories, and know what to do with it, mm -hmm. and respect it, and give it a lot of love and care, and they trusted us. And 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 even uh, Nicole had a brilliant idea, which was I wasn't originally interviewed for the film, and then. We decided I needed to be, and Nicole said, "Well, Denise needs Denise Jacobson for our film needs to be on the other side of the camera. You need to be talking to her." And that really stopped me from filtering, you know, having any BS. It really, <laughs> you know, I, I really, you know, I could have tried to imagine, but Denise being there, it's like, and so that made me much more authentic. And so, and and part of the question is about filmmaking and being disabled and and advice, I wanna say that, that there is, that it's essential that people from the disabled community make films. That Crip Camp is one story out of thousands and thousands of stories. And, and everybody out there that has a disability or anybody out there that's from a marginalized community, you hold on to stories that only you really, really know. And that they're important to hear because we have greater understanding, and uh, and so I, I uh, you know, what I'll mention to you, you know, if you really um, want to know a little bit more about this, is that I helped found an organization called Forward Doc, which stands for Filmmakers with Disabilities Dash Documentary, and if you uh, look online for fwd dash doc dot org, we are uh, a group of well over two hundred and fifty people now with disabilities and our allies working in the documentary space. And, and so uh, I would say go out there and try it and believe that, you know, believe in yourself that it's possible. And, uh, and 
the watchword for our film has always been community. Mm. And I think it's the universal advice to anybody about almost anything. How do I do something? How do I, you know, how do I figure out how to, you know, cook? I mean, it's like, find your community. Find other people that are doing this. Come together. The power of one plus one is greater than two. Absolutely. Find your tribe. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Here's another question from the audience. When the young man asked Nancy Rosenblum if what she was communicating was her need and right for privacy, was that what she was really saying? Did he interpret that correctly? Because that was such a powerful scene. It, it, it was. I mean, it, it took a long time to really figure out what she was saying. I've caught a lot of the words finally. Mm -hmm. She basically was talking about her mother and saying, wherever I am, she's there. She's always there. And that she didn't have a chance simply for privacy. That was powerful because when you, when you think of people in the disabled community, you don't really think about something that, that seems like such a simple thing to us, but it's a huge thing for the disabled community because you don't have any privacy. There was one scene where, I, I, I'm not sure if it was you or who it was, was talking about how, I think it was you talking about how your mother has to go to the store just to get things for you and do all these things for you, how you're not really, how you weren't really able to have that privacy to just have a moment to yourself. And that is such a huge, huge thing to have been pointed out, something that most of us would have never, ever, ever thought about. I, I enjoyed that moment very much. Um, why do you think the general public has this idea? Judy describes in the film that people with a disability are asexual. How damaging do you think this misconception is toward achieving equal rights? <laughs> You're muted, baby. So sorry. That's okay. <laughs> uh, hey, look, you know, if you aren't somebody that somebody wants to be with or love or have sex with, what else do they not want? They don't want to hire you necessarily. They, when you look upon someone as, as not being interested or not uh, being capable, you are really limiting what you think that person could be as a partner. And um, it is not the case in my community. I can, I could tell you off camera chapter and verse my community and how that is really, really not the case. Um, first, first hand experience, no pun intended. Uh -uh. <laughs> okay, let's just <laughs> let's wait. Let's just, <laughs> and then he left the camera. Oh, wow. So wait, this is what was really funny. When y'all had the crabs break out, <laughs> which they showed in the trailer, when the crabs break out happened, how at first everybody was all excited and hyped up about it until y'all discovered really what that was. And then there's this, there's the footage of all the mattresses and all this stuff being splayed out all over the grass, all over the grounds, how people, I think Judy was talking about how y'all would just like go off in corners and making out. I'm like, y'all had more fun than I ever had as a teenager. I'm just saying. I didn't have that much freedom as a teenager and I didn't have that kind of camp to go to. As a matter of fact, I don't think I ever saw a camp like that until I saw that movie Dirty Dancing. I didn't even know that camps of that ilk existed until I saw Dirty Dancing and I sure didn't know that Camp Janad existed. So that was a, a, an awakening for me. But y'all had shenanigans. I was down for all of that. I'm like, well, okay. Because at the end of the day, y'all are human beings. You're not Martians. I love that. It no, made me laugh out loud. They wanted us to have a summer camp experience. They wanted us to be relieved as much as we could of the burdens and stereotypes and everything else that we experienced outside of that camp and to have a great time. It looked like y'all had a ball. You did. You really did. It was great. Oh, well, let's flip over to the music for a minute. Um, a question from the audience says, the music for this film was so much fun. It really was and emblematic of an era. Would you talk about what it was like building the soundtrack for Crip Camp? I'll let Nicole take one, take that one first. We had a 
great time building the soundtrack. I mean, from the very beginning, Jim was like, this is, you know, when he was trying to sell me on the idea originally um, of the project, he was like, you know, that this was down the road from Woodstock, like all that stuff was, you know, on the record player all the time. We had a camp radio station, you know, so we always knew that kind of like the music of the era would be important. And part of the reason it was is that we knew that people didn't think of the disability community as being part of that era, right, of the popular culture of that era. And Jeanne was a place where where the disability community was just like the Vietnam. Nobody thinks about like the, the disabled protesters who were there at some of the big Vietnam protests of the early 70s, but they were there, you know, so we wanted to we, you know, we wanted to use some really iconic songs that people think of in like lots of other contexts. Um, and we didn't want to tire people out by playing these like very classic songs, but we were more we were really trying to say like this is a this is an era and a movement and a um, a philosophy that you know of, but you don't know about this this aspect of it. So um, so yeah, we we both brought uh, songs to the table. Jim brought a lot of Grateful Dead, um, <laughs> and actually we had there was one really amazing Grateful Dead song that we used to have in, in at the very beginning of the film that we couldn't get the rights to, um, but that, that was just gorgeous. Um, and uh, and some of the some of the songs came through pretty easily. People saw clips of the film and just were like, "Yeah, you know, great." And we had an amazing music supervisor, um, Amine Raymer, who actually was just nominated for a Music Supervisors Guild um, award, which is really exciting. And you know, so uh, but then other ones like um, like Sugar Mountain, it took us forever to get that song, and we were so. Uh, keen on it because it just really felt um, like that it had to be there at the end of the film and it came through right at the last minute. So, um, I mean, it was it was uh, our editors, you know, brought amazing things to the table, like a ship, which is, you know, in the trailer and at the end. Amine brought in Jim and I heard it and we thought, oh, my God, you know, that's the that is the the sort of collective spirit just embodied. And um, it was it was a blast. It was really fun to work on it. I mean oh. the Richie the Richie Havens from Woodstock performance of Freedom just what a tee up for the film. I mean my gosh. I just have goosebumps just saying the title. <laughs> I love it. The soundtrack was the bomb. I'm like Crimson and Clover, come on. It doesn't get any better than that. That was my oh. idea. <laughs> That was my jam. I'm like, okay, I'll write for some Crimson and Clover. Let's talk about how, so I, I think, Jim, did you come to Nicole and Nicole came to you about the film? And then how did y'all get from that collaboration to higher ground with the Obamas? Um, you know, my career has been in um, mixing uh, film for many, many years and documentaries primarily. And in the Bay Area, there's this, incredible community of documentary filmmakers. And Nicole was one of my actually earlier clients when I started my my company. And when she was wrapping up her last uh, feature length films, uh, Revolutionary Optimist, this is six years ago now, I took her out to lunch because I, I loved, we became friends and I really loved her as a filmmaker. And I was trying to get her interested in maybe making a film around disability, the kind of films I wanted to see. And really, it, believe it or not, it was almost an offhand remark at the end as we're going back to the building. I kind of sheepishly said, you know, I've actually wanted to see a film about my summer camp. I think there's a connection here to this disabled civil rights movement of these people going from New York out to Berkeley. That would be a really great story. And I started telling her a little bit about the camp. And, you know, Nicole... <laughs> I was smitten, um, you know, but and pretty immediately um, because the images that he was painting in my mind, I mean, I had never heard, I never imagined anything like Camp Jeanette, you know, I think that's kind of one of the really profound things, you know, one of the things Denise Jacobson said when, when we took that trip back to the old campsite, which is at the end of the film, she said, it was our golden age. And there was something that we wanted to really try to get across in the end of the film about the idea that this place was a place where inclusion and equality existed in a way that it still really doesn't, you know? 
Um, so it's that idea of like, you can't go back to your youth, but also like this idea that like, it's been 50 years, you know, and the world still doesn't really look much like Camp Jened. So I was very blown away by, by the pictures Jim sent me, the idea of kind of like evoking this camp. And, but I luckily, um, realized really right away in thinking about it, that the really wonderful thing was that it was Jim's story. It was his life and that Jim, you know, had basically been in film school, uh, you know, watching hundreds and hundreds of documentaries. And he, he would critique them with me when I came in to work with him. <laughs> he talked about everybody else's films. And so I knew that he and I shared an aesthetic sense and that we got along, you know, we were great colleagues and friends. And so um, I just couldn't imagine, like, if I was to direct this film, and I was excited about the idea of Jim's personal voice and Jim's perspective, and 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 I'm kind of like giving the viewer, letting the viewer in on the kind of journey that I had been on, kind of coming to know disability as a community and a culture and and a, and a history, the way that Jim had introduced it to me. So, anyway, I asked him if he would direct with me, and and luckily he said he said yes, and. And you know, it was it was about the point where we had a, um, a sort of we're starting to cut an assembly together and had a trailer that our executive producer read in the trades about higher ground, the Obama's um, production company being formed, and he said, "Oh my God, we have to try to get this in front of them because." You know, it's a film about grassroots organizing and young people making change. And Judy Human worked in the Obama State Department. And this could be perfect. And in our initial outreach, they were like, yeah, we're still trying to figure out what our company is about. We don't really know what we're doing. And our sales agent said, well, just please watch this trailer. And then Priya uh, Swami Nathan, who, who runs Higher Ground with Tonya Davis, called and said, I don't know what you guys did, but I can't stop watching this thing. And my bosses feel the same way which was incredibly exciting to us. I mean, literally, we thought we, we had landed on Mars. We could not believe this was actually happening. And she said, I want to fly up to Oakland and spend some time with you guys in the edit room and see if this could be a fit. And, um, and ultimately, they said they wanted to partner with us. And, and, uh, and I will say that they said, we, we are going to roll our sleeves up and really make this film with you as partners. And they really did. And um, Mrs. Obama and President Obama watched three different cuts of the film and gave us feedback and, um, you know, have been so generous with, with their platform and their support of the project. And it's, um, it's meant the world to us. And it's just been an incredible journey. I'm just stuck on, they gave us feedback. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm getting feedback from the president of the United States and the first lady on my movie. Okay. Let me just sit, let that sink in for a second. That's awesome. I kind of love that. I love that so much. You brought up Oakland and there's a question in the audience from someone that says, without knowing too much about the start of the disability civil rights movement from the film, it seems like those years in the Bay Area were one starting point. Do you think this could have happened anywhere else as well as it happened in the Bay Area? I mean, uh, other, other parts of the country were starting to get active. I mean, for, for certain. And and in fact, the day of the 504 sit-in of the federal building happened, I believe it was 17 other cities participated. Um, and Washington, they they couldn't last more than a day. They decided to occupy, but they weren't able to get food and support. But the Bay Area being the place it is, and also the groundwork that Kitty Cohen and and everybody else and Judy had really sat down where, you know, and we looked at old footage and you would see people from Camp Chenet or other folks at like a, like one of the first gay, gay pride parades or at a, they were going out and being part of it. So when it came our turn, so to speak, people got on board, like you've been showing up for us, we're going to show up for you. And yeah, the Bay Area, Moscone, the, the God bless him, the, the mayor, it's like, yeah, we want to be helpful. And um, so it does feel a little bit like it, only in the Bay Area story, um, but it was earned that way, I think. It was part you, of the culture up here. Yeah, you know, I, I, I was also struck by the fact that, you know, we have a film that's out right now called Judas and the Black Messiah, which is dealing with the, the life of Chairman Fred Hampton. And throughout the 
the documentary Crip, Cramp, Crip Camp, at some point it is mentioned that when you guys go into that federal building, that the Panthers were the ones that helped provide food for, for the people that were there, um, standing, da standing down their ground. And I thought that was so incredibly important and prolific to show because the Black Panther Party gets such a bad rap about being violent and this and that. And a lot of people don't realize, and it's been coming out more and more through a variety of different projects, that that was not their aim goal. Their aim goal was to be treated equally just like the disabled community was to be treated equally. Would you guys mind speaking to including that part of the story? Because I thought that was very powerful. It was really important to us. We were so excited when we learned about that and when we started to hear stories you know, from folks who interacted with the Panthers in the building and remembered that whole thing happening. And um, you know, I think in Oakland, we were, we were very proud of that history and we, we, we know um, the fullness of the story. Um, a, a lot of folks here, you know, it's like they're, my my kids did a whole uh, fourth grade um, unit on on Panther history and had people come in and talk to them and and so um, you know for I think that the the idea that the sense was this is a cause that represents the kind of world we want to see and so we're going to show up for it was so powerful and the fact is that. It's, it was, there's no stronger way to show the importance of kind of cross movement solidarity because they literally would not have been successful if it weren't for the Black Panthers because they provided meals three times a day, you know, the entire length of the sit in. I mean, I, I do find that so incredibly extraordinary. Um, and then it was also really important to us because um, in, in that this story has been not well enough known, even though it has been told and told well before, um, when it has been told, the story of particularly um, people of leaders of color and people of color in in that story have has has you know uh, not been highlighted, and so Brad Lomax, you know, um, who was the who, who was a, uh, an activist, a disabled activist who actually ran a separate center for independent living in Oakland at the time, you know, having the idea to reach out to the Panthers and because he was one, you know, being able to then um, get that kind of support um, was also a way for us to really start to open the door towards, you know, uh, considering this sort of intersectional experience of, of disability. And um, I mean, I feel like there's a whole another movie that could be made um, you know about that history in, in particular but uh but it was really for for us it you know not only was it important to highlight the history but it also just like helped us elevate themes that were really important to us in the telling of the story i think in the last couple of years there's been such a highlight on the dis the this the disabled community you know earlier this year at sundance the premiere film like you all were the premiere film the year before was CODA dealing with the deaf community. And um, there's Sound of Metal that's out now that's also dealing with the deaf community. So I think that there is an awareness and a spotlight being put on the community that we've never seen before that's showing that the community is just like Jim described earlier in the conversation, just that, a community a community of people that are fighting for civil rights, just like everybody else is. We just all want to be treated the same with the same common decency and respect that you all deserve. So having said that, this has been a great discussion. I was so excited to have this conversation with you, Nicole, and with you, Jim. Thank you so much for allowing me to discuss your story and your project on behalf of American Cinematech. So thank you so very much for that. Um, are you guys working on any new projects, things that we can look out for moving forward? We, you know, we're working on some things together and separately, and um, but we're never going to be very far far apart from each other ever. Cool. Well, thank you, Nicole Noonan. Thank you, Jim. Bra that was so vague. I just gotta, I just gotta go with the flow. <laughs> yeah, Let's like watch this space, okay? Yeah, we're not. I'm we're reading not done the room yet. right now. I'm reading we're, the room right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not done yet. <laughs> but thank you, Jim Labret. 
Thank you, Nicole Noonan. Thank you so much for bringing Crip Camp to the big screen for all to see it. It's been my pleasure to have this conversation with you. And everybody go to Netflix. If you haven't seen it already, for those who are watching this after we've done this Q&A, go to Netflix, go to Netflix, go to Netflix and screen Crip Camp. Screen it with your family. Tell your friends about it. It is a beautifully orchestrated film. You will not be disappointed. I'm your moderator, Carla Renata. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Carla. And echoing everything you just said, th thank you to, to Jim and Nicole. This was such a, a powerful discussion. It was really important for us at the Cinematheque to be able to, to put this on tonight. And yes, thank you. You know, echoing what, she's, echoing what she said, please go seek out this film if you haven't seen it yet. Tell everyone you know about it. it, it it's a really beautiful film to have out in the world. So uh, a big thank you to you, Carla, for uh, leading this discussion to, tonight. It was, it's always a pleasure to have you. Um, Thank you to our wonderful audience uh, for tuning in and for sending all your amazing questions. It's, it's always a pleasure to, to, to see your, your replies in the Q&A box. So keep it up. Uh, we'll see you next week for our Q&A for Lapsus. Uh, uh, thanks again for watching and have a great night. <laughs>